From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo, and this is From the South. The leader of the popular force party, Keiko Fujimori, has appeared in a court hearing in Peru. Keiko is being accused of leading a corruption network that received illicit funds from several companies, among them Brazilian construction giant Odebrecht. On Wednesday, the prosecutor asked the judiciary to give the opposition leader 36 months of preventive detention. And after 18 hours of debate and discord with rubber bullets and tear gas filling the air inside, Argentina's lower house has approved the budget for 2019. The proposed budget was passed with 138 votes in favor and 103 against. Tens of thousands had protested outside Congress against the budget. They said it involves huge cuts and was imposed by the International Monetary Fund. The bill will now go to the Senate for debate and a vote scheduled for next month. The very deputies and senators should start cutting budgets allocated for themselves because they have cut the budgets for health, for schooling, for studies. It's also a clear example of governability. In this case, the International Monetary Fund is showing that in Argentina, these measures can be taken and that the road is clear for the cutbacks to start. Our correspondent Buenos Aires, Edgardo Esteban, tells us more. After an intense 18-hour debate and protest in the streets, the lower house has approved the budget for 2019. Lawmakers denounced they were threatened after the debate, while social movement and labor unions say the new bill will only bring more austerity measures and recession to the country. The bill will now go to the Senate in the next three weeks to get the final approval. The new budget will directly affect the education, health, and social sectors, as it prioritizes the government's agreement with the International Monetary Fund. The protests were met with a fierce response from the police. At least 31 demonstrators were arrested. Telesur's own journalists were caught up in the violence and a camera person was struck by a rubber bullet. Amid what has been called a brutal suppression and in spite of strong opposition from various groups, the officialism achieved quorum to be in the budget adjustment issued by the IMF. If this budget is implemented, what will prevail is poverty, exclusion, social inequality, closing of hospitals. That is why we tell the politicians, you weren't elected to surrender. You have to rise up because the working people are on the streets demanding an end to repression. We are asking for this budget budget adjustment to be struck down. Just like the darkest time in Argentina, the police force beat up citizens who were peacefully demonstrating. They tried to infiltrate political and social movements and hold them accountable for the rioting. The police and intelligence services are trying to deny the people their right to protest in front of the Congress. It doesn't matter who's presiding over the session today. Analysts warn that with the budgetary allocation to pay the interest of foreign debt, Macri's dominance over the most vulnerable will only get worse next year. The main thing is that they are approving a budget that goes against Argentine people. It is a 400 billion cut that will negatively affect health care, education, workers, salary, public works, and all this will result in more unemployment. Amid massive layoffs and extreme rate hikes, this budget cut proposed by the Macri's government will only serve to deepen discontent among Argentinians. There is an exponential growth in the payment of foreign debt interests. There is also concern about the peso devaluation and the flight of capital. This is why it is important to protest, because even if the National Congress manages to approve the proposed fiscal measures, it will be a political defeat because the majority of the country is opposed to that budget. Despite the bullets and the tear gas, Argentinians will continue to take action on the outskirts of the Congress because they know that if the budget becomes law, the impact on society will be devastating. And most of those arrested during the protests have now been released. They walked free in the early hours in the morning. They said their detention was targeted persecution, orchestrated by plainclothes policemen who infiltrated the crowds. Demonstrators in Chile were also suppressed as, the, as they demanded the government eliminates the pension system inherited from the military dictatorship. 
Students, teachers and unions are strongly against private companies managing workers' retirement savings. One year ago, more than one million people took to the streets to demand a retirement plan that takes into account the needs of the people. We, the students, are fighting along with workers, our teachers and all of those who help us. We know they are also going through difficult times. We see it in our schools. So the support and cohesion are key in this struggle for change. We're trying to generate massive support as in the past. People tend to give some leeway to a government early in its tenure. But people also trust that a government is going to fulfill its promises. However, over the past seven months, the government has failed to answer the people's concerns. On contrary, it has now turned around and decided to force a law down the throats of its most vulnerable citizens, retirees. This government does not legislate for citizens, but for banks and markets. That is the big problem. We are regular workers who generate wealth. We are not lazy people. Investment funds and social parasites are the bad guys. These private companies, known as pension fund administrators, which invest in market stocks, have taken the money of Chilean people. In the end, it's big business that stands to benefit, not the pensioners. We need a fair pension system for our elderly. Old people will not have added misery. But we also need a system for us and our sons and daughters. This pension system was put in place in 1981 by the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. The plan is the brainchild of Jose Piñera. A fraudulent study says we have one of the eight best retirement plans in the world, but that's a lie. You can see it's a lie when old people have to work beyond 60, 70, 80 years old. We have an alternative proposal, a shared system with a three-way contribution. That is a solidarity system. Luis Messina was one of the protest leaders who was arrested by police. Government has not made any statement regarding the detention of about a dozen demonstrators. Right-wing candidate Jair Bolsonaro has said his opponent, Fernando Haddad, can only win office with an electoral fraud. Bolsonaro's comments came after Ibope released a survey that showed the gap between himself and Haddad has narrowed down. Meanwhile, Fernando Haddad has met with the head of the Organization of American States mission in Brazil for the election. On the meeting, they discussed fraud allegations and concerns over the spreading of fake news during the campaign season. Haddad once again rejected his opponent, Jair Bolsonaro's comments inciting violence. And as the campaign comes to an end, Haddad is expressing confidence ahead of Sunday's votes. Thousands of supporters rallied for the Workers' Party candidate in Sao Paulo, Chanti Haddad, yes. He says in the end, the people will have the final say, so he's not faced by the latest polls showing Bolsonaro could clinch victory. Jair Bolsonaro and Fernando Haddad. There are two very different candidates with equally divergent proposals for the education sector. So what are Haddad and Bolsonaro's policies? Here's our special series, Bolsonaro or Haddad, to opposing visions for Brazil. Fiscal adjustment is part and parcel of Brazil's current economic situation. The Senate approved an austerity package to freeze social spending for 20 years. Jair Bolsonaro, a sitting member of parliament, approved that measure, while his political rival, Fernando Haddad, strongly opposed it. Bolsonaro, the far-right presidential candidate, has said that education is a major focus. He says there's a need to expand the curriculum so that more maths, science and Portuguese are taught in schools. On the issue of the economy, the Workers' Party candidate, Haddad, has vowed to do away with the constitutional amendment which enabled the freezing of public spending for two decades. Thousands of voters remember the days when Haddad was education minister. Back then, he opened over 400 technical schools and 18 universities. Now he's promising to strengthen primary level education 
and improve tertiary level programs. For my students, who are black students from the poorest sector, they had the opportunity of good public education program, but this opportunity is now at risk. They know that voting for Haddad means voting for the continuity of this education trust, which I believe will help hundreds of people. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro has failed to present any proposals to improve basic education. He's also said he supports the privatization of public universities and the introduction of distance learning programs. These are measures which the population is divided on. Who guarantees that those who go to class are really studying? Who guarantees that students get food in their schools? Everything is a mystery. My cousin studied under a distance learning program and now he's a professor. Teachers replace the parents when they are not at home. In my time, it was like that. I think that it is fundamental that children are in the schools and not learning through a virtual platform. Out of 50 million students in basic education in Brazil, 80% are in public schools. Experts say they will be the most affected by Bolsonaro's proposals. The proposals of reducing public funds for education are wrong. Bolsonaro represents a serious threat to the right of our children to have a bright future. His program actually says that the state is not responsible to guarantee basic education for lower income children. This Sunday, when 147 million voters choose their next president, their decision will have an impact well beyond the four years of the presidential term. It will affect the future of a whole generation, schooled on the basis of the educational proposals of one of these candidates. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. United States President Donald Trump has said he is going to send the army to the border with Mexico as the migrant caravan is getting closer. On Twitter, Trump described the situation as a national emergency. It has been confirmed he will send 800 military men to the border. The migrant caravan continues on its long trek towards Mexico's northern border. On Wednesday, the main body of the caravan set off towards Mazatepec in the state of Chiapas. To avoid the extreme heat, migrants in the caravan resumed their journey early in the morning. At about 3.30 in the morning, the group filled up one lane of the Pan American Highway that will take them from village to village until the town of Arriaga. Some of them are already tried to reach the border with the United States before. It's been a long time since I have been in El Salvador. I was deported from the United States and I decided to migrate again with all these people in the caravan. People get more tired as the days pass by. They haven't slept and they eat whatever people give them in solidarity. I give them tacos or whatever I have at home. It is food from my shop. It is the only thing I have to help them out. People in the caravan face a lot of risks, but they keep moving forward. It was very hard to pass through Guatemala because I almost got raped. A guy who passed by protected my friend and I with a knife. My friend went back to Honduras because she was really scared. The Mexican Secretary of Domestic Affairs says 110 Honduran citizens resigned to their asylum application and have asked to be taken to their home country. More migrants are trying to cross into Mexico to join the caravan. We go to our correspondent Pablo Perez, who is on the Guatemalan side of the border. They have walked over 300 miles and they still have energy to play an impromptu man match of soccer here at uh, Tecunumán Central Park. This is the last city in Guatemala they're going to be in until they reach uh, Mexican soil. The, the, this, uh, this step has been a little difficult the last few days because Mexican authorities have closed the gate for, to the migrants and uh, only letting them in in a very small number the last uh, the day after yesterday, the day before yesterday, they admitted only 44 of them. So 
This one here that has been uh, coming to Tecunumán in small numbers all during all, the, all of the night are waiting for a big group that is coming from Guatemala City to, uh, to, to see if their numbers, if they can reach over 400, 500, like, like the last time the Mexican government let them in, they can, well, force the authorities to uh, enact the law, the, the law, the asylum and refugee law that all Latin American countries have signed for. And they say that they cannot, they cannot stop the people who are moving internationally for humanitarian reasons. Something that has not been enacted by all uh, the governments lately, mostly they say because of the threats by Donald Trump's government of ending financial aid and even in the Mexican case, uh, sending troops to the border and closing it down. We thank Pablo Perez for that report. More news now. Venezuela's President Nicolás Maduro has called U.S. Vice President Mike Pence a crazy extremist over his migration caravan accusation. Maduro dismissed Pence's claim that the group was financed by Venezuela. He fired back at Pence during a meeting broadcast on state television. Y lo segundo es preocupación porque... The third school of decolonial critical thought has been taking place in Venezuela. Academics from various countries came together to discuss the use of the media to criminalize social movements and the people they represent. The speakers at this forum made clear their stand against colonialism, something they say is still alive and which seeks to assert itself in the form of sexism against peoples who decided to assert their independence from imperialism. There is an imperial feminism that Fanon described in his book Black Skin, White Masks, a feminism that goes against immigrant women. According to them, colonial domination should have no place in today's world. They analyze issues like the rise of the right in Brazil the indifference of international organizations in the face of humanitarian crisis and the campaign against Venezuela. Today there is a turning of the screw against Latin America, which is seen in some geopolitical areas as the enemy. Today Venezuela is that enemy which allows the U.S. to return to Latin America. Venezuela is the justification for U.S. imperial actions. But not only against Venezuela. The race of the right in Brazil and what happened with Lula is not a coincidence. The participants agreed to defend Venezuelan sovereignty from international interference. It's obvious that there is a media war where they pretend to smear the struggles in Venezuela and in other Latin America countries. For this forum, political harassment and economic blockade are the strategies of the international right against the progress of democracy and decolonization that some South American nations are seeking. A hearing on Juliana Sanchez's case against the Ecuadorian state has been suspended. Our correspondent Denise Herrera is outside the court in Quito. Hello, we are outside the Judiciary Council in Quito, where the hearing against the government of Ecuador has been suspended. The judge has decided that uh, they need a special translator that can, that, that can communicate Julian Assange with the defense team of the government of Ecuador and also with his defense team, who should remember weekly the stress that is, this action comes seven months after April of treatment to withdraw the protection and has cut off the access to the outside world. Julian Assange and his defense team said uh, the government of Ecuador violating uh, his fundamental right of freedom. So now the defense team of Julian Assange and the defense team of the government of Ecuador have to wait the decision of the judge and where uh, when the hearing will resume. So it's all for now. Back to you at the studio. Thank you, Denise, for your report. Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno and his proven counterpart Martín Vizcarra have celebrated 20 years of peace. 
Both countries signed the Brasilia Presidential Act, which ended the territorial dispute. Vizcarra said that agreement has turned Peru and Ecuador into a regional role model for political coordination. The two leaders attended a ceremony in the presidential palace in Ecuador's capital, Quito. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. We are present at every event of where our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Welcome back. Dozens of people have held a vigil outside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to call for justice on the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Holding candles and pictures of the journalists, demonstrators said they will not accept compromises regarding Khashoggi's case. Hours before the vigil, Saudi Arabia's public prosecutor said that the, mur that the murder was premeditated. The journalist was last seen entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul three weeks ago. <laughs> Heavy floodings in Russia have killed two people and another one remains missing after a cyclone hit south of the country. Around 500 people have been evacuated. According to local police, more than 2,000 houses were destroyed by the floodings. At least 18 people have died in a flash flood near Jordan's Dead Sea. According to rescuers and hospital workers, victims were mainly school children and teachers who were on a field trip. 34 people were rescued in an, in an operation involving police, helicopter, and army troops. Water rapidly rushed beneath a bridge close to the Dead Sea. And now let's take a look at some other stories making headlines around the world. Facebook has been fined 645,000 US dollars by the United Kingdom. The UK's Information Commissioner's Office fined the social media company over its involvement in the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. Facebook shared some of the 87 million people's data with Cambridge Analytica it took without permission. The firm used the data for targeted political advertising in the US. South Korean authorities have exhumed the remains of two soldiers in the demilitarized zone shared with North Korea as part of the demining operation. Officials estimate the remains of more than 10,000 soldiers are in the DMZ area, including South Korean and UN soldiers. They were killed during the Korean War between 1950 and 53. The war hasn't officially ended as no peace treaty was signed. It is of great significance that we have discovered the first remains of a putative South Korean soldier at this point. In the process of preparation for the North and South Joint Recovery Operation, as a result of the military agreement, also it is assumed that there are more than 10,000 remains in the DMC area, including the UN forces as well as South Korean soldiers. The European Parliament has awarded the Saharov Human Prize to Ukrainian filmmaker Oleg Sentsov, who is currently jailed in Russia over an alleged arson plot in Crimea. The 42-year-old filmmaker received 58,000 US dollar prize for an exceptional contribution to human rights around the world. The other runner-ups for the award included 11 charities saving migrants in the Mediterranean and American activists. 
And lastly, thousands of people have protested outside Madrid's cathedral against the new burial site for dictator Francisco Franco. Franco's remains were transferred from the monument known as the Valley of the Fallen. The dictator's family had proposed to relocate the body to the cathedral after a law required to exhume it. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news. With these and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.